thanks everybody so much for joining us tonight. Um, tonight we're going to talk about one of my favorite holidays uh, and the foods associated with it. So it's Trick or Treat, a history of Halloween food tradition. Um, my name is Sarah Wasberg Johnson. I am a food historian. Uh, and like I said, Halloween is my favorite holiday. So we're going to be talking about all kinds of fun foods and candy associated with Halloween tonight. So we're going to start with the origins of Halloween, um, which are a little murky, but most people agree that the origins of what we know today as Halloween is in the Celtic uh, pagan holiday of Samhain, uh, which is halfway between the autumn equinox and the winter solstice. Uh, sometimes it's called a cross quarter holiday for that reason. Um, it is a pre-Christian Celtic ancestor festival. It's kind of like considered a time of year when, you know, the veil between the worlds grows thin uh, and you can communicate with people on the other side, right, with the dead, with ancestors. Um, but also sometimes some kind of spooky other things come through that maybe you don't necessarily want. Uh, the Christian Catholic Church kind of, I think, adopts some of this with their holidays. That's something that happened a lot in the early Christian church is the adoption of holidays that were similar to pagan holidays. And for October 31st is known as All Saints Eve or also All Hallows Eve, which is how we get the term Halloween. And you'll see as in this little image, I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but in the image here on the right, it says Halloween, right? And there's a little apostrophe there, that is a contraction of the word even or evening. So that's how we get the term Halloween. Um, so All Saints Eve is the night before All Saints Day, which is a Catholic festival honoring all of the Catholic saints. Um, and then November 1st is All Souls Eve because that's the night before All Souls Day, which is um, a Catholic feast day kind of remembering those who've gone before us, right? It's it's a basically an ancestor festival. Um, so what we know today as Halloween, a lot of the traditions developed uh, in the kind of Celtic Isles, right? In Scotland and Ireland, Scotland has a tradition called guising, which is very similar to our modern trick-or-treating. Um, they also had some a lot of interesting stuff happening with kale, which is why there's this nice little Scottish postcard of cabbages, right? We'll be talking a little bit more about some of those traditions later. And then Ireland also had a lot of uh, Halloween traditions. Um, Halloween was also known as Colcannon Night, which is a divination ceremony involving Colcannon, which is mashed potatoes and cabbage or mashed potatoes and kale. Um, and it's also known as Snap Apple Night. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But those are the primary um, traditions that are influencing what's happening in the United States. So Halloween in the United States was not really celebrated until we start to get um, large numbers of immigrants coming from Ireland in the 1830s and 40s. And we normally today associate it with New England and maybe with like Salem because of the witch trials, right? But New England was very, um, you know, Protestants did not really celebrate Halloween, especially in the kind of more um, puritanical New England. Uh, so this is this is coming with uh, a lot of these immigrant communities. It's being adopted in areas where, you know, some of the religious beliefs are a little less strict, uh, including the American South. Um, but it spreads throughout the United States uh, by the time we get to the end of the 19th century. And I thought we would also talk a little bit about the Christmas Halloween connection, which you might think, Sarah, what are you talking about? There is no connection between Christmas and Halloween. Well, guess what? There totally is. So trick-or-treating is very similar to the British Christmas traditions of mumming um, and wassailing. So mumming is like dressing up and parading through the town. Uh, wassailing is you're going door to door, you're singing Christmas carols or wassail um, songs in exchange for treats, right? Um, the game Snapdragon, 
which I'll explain what that is in a little bit, was very popular uh, as a 12th night, which is part of the Christmas season game in the Elizabethan period. In the 19th century, it becomes a very popular Halloween game. Gingerbread, again, going back to the medieval period, very popular for Halloween, or sorry, for Christmas throughout Europe, um, gets adopted in the 19th century as kind of a typical Halloween uh, food, I think in large part because of the color. <laughs> it's a very dark cake, right? Um, popcorn balls, super popular uh, throughout the 19th century, but mostly associated with Halloween until we get into the 20th century and they start to associate them with Christmas, like we have in this nice little advertisement from the 60s. Um, and so here's some examples of how they're connected. So this is uh, the first and last verse of the Gloucestershire Wassail Carol, right? So they're talking about their wassailing bowl, which is full of alcohol. And the last, the last verse is, come butler, fill us a bowl of the best, then we hope that your soul in heaven may rest. But if you do draw us a bowl of the small, which is small beer, right? Instead of the good stuff, the hard liquor, then down shall go butler, bowl and all. Right, so they're basically saying, if you don't give us the treat that you want, we're gonna play a trick on you and beat you up, basically. <laughs> so this is an example of a Christmas carol, a very popular Christmas carol, although most people usually don't get to the eighth verse, but it's very similar to um, kind of what becomes the trick or the treat, right? Give us a treat or we're gonna play a trick on you. Uh, this is an illustration of the game Snap Apple. It's a 19th century illustration, but it's it's illustrating an Elizabethan family. So Snap Apple is basically you take a large shallow bowl and you fill it with raisins or almonds, then you pour brandy over it and then you light the brandy on fire. And the object of the game is to snatch the burning um, uh, raisins or almonds out and then you can eat them, they're brandy soaked. Right, so the alcohol is burning off, which is why kids are able to do it, but it's kind of a scary game. Brandy burns blue, it's very eerie. So I think that's kind of why it gets adopted more toward Halloween when it comes to the United States rather than at Christmas time. So this is a 19th century uh, American postcard depicting a girl with her jack-o'-lanterns and she's playing Snapdragon. Um, Halloween foods in the United States and in Europe are very seasonal, right? So we have pumpkins and squash being um, indigenous American foods are very quickly adopted in the United States. They're readily available in the fall. They store very well. Apples and cider also, apples are very great. They're probably our best long storing fruit in the Northern climes. Uh, and cider is another way to preserve apples. Nuts. Also very popular this time of year, although we don't usually associate them now with Halloween. They were definitely associated historically. Popcorn, again, fall harvest. Popcorn is readily available. It lasts a long time. It makes a great snack. Kale and cabbage are also available this time of year. And there's all sorts of Celtic lore that grows up around those two things. And then, of course, we have our traditional root vegetables, turnips, rutabaga, potatoes, and carrots. Um, and I found this great little fairy tale illustration of a couple of witches uh, and some anthropomorphic vegetables, right? They all have their own little faces and legs and they're dancing around. So very typical early, early 20th century illustration. So let's talk about pumpkins, right? Pumpkins are probably the thing we associate most with Halloween today in the United States. And that is in large part due to the, the proliferation of the jack-o'-lantern, right? So the legend behind the jack-o'-lantern is a guy by the name of Stingy Jack. So he is the jack of the lantern, right? Which is what jack-o'-lantern means. Um, stingy Jack is a guy who is stingy, like he doesn't like to spend a lot of money, and he has a whole series of encounters with the devil in this folktale, and Stingy Jack usually comes out on top of the bargain, right? So one example is he and the devil are drinking in a tavern, and Stingy Jack convinces the devil to turn himself into a coin so they can pay the barman, but then instead of paying the barman, Stingy Jack puts the devil as a coin into his pocket where there's also a silver cross 
So the devil can't change back into the devil because he's trapped by the cross. And so he makes a deal with Stingy Jack to let him change back. So there's a whole bunch of these instances of Stingy Jack getting the best of the devil. And the end result is that the devil finally agrees not to take Stingy Jack's soul, right? But then when Jack gets to heaven, heaven's like, no, you're not a good person. We don't want you. So the devil doesn't want him either. So he's kind of doomed to wander the earth forever. And the devil gives him um, a burning coal to carry in a lantern. And that's where we get um, the Jack O' Lantern. It's also very similar to the, the Will of the Wisp traditions, which is William of the Wisp. Wisp is an archaic word for a torch, right? Which is if you live anywhere um, near a marsh or a fen, right? There's, there's lights that you can see in the darkness. It's usually like phosphorescent um, uh, mushrooms or sometimes it's swamp gases that light right? Um, but that's where those traditions come from. Uh, in Europe, because they didn't have pumpkins, right? Those are an Indigenous American thing. They made their lanterns out of turnips. And I'll show you an illustration in a minute. But then when they come to the United States, pumpkins are widely available. They're very easy to grow. They're much larger than turnips, and they are much easier to carve than turnips. Turnips are tough. Uh, other pumpkin things that we associate with Halloween historically is pumpkin pie. <laughs> so nowadays we totally associate that with, with Thanksgiving, but you see it on a lot of historic uh, Halloween menus and references to Halloween, they're talking about pumpkin pie. So this is a very sweet um, illustration. It's not that terrifying turnip <laughs> lantern illustration you may be seeing going around the, the internet. Um, this is a late 19th century one. And this little boy is carving a turnip, right? Here's another turnip lantern already made. And you can see there's giant turnips in the foreground, right? This is the storage area. And the important thing to notice about turnip lanterns is that you carve the face first and then you hollow it out. Because if you try to hollow it out and then carve the face, it usually uh, breaks or cracks or otherwise does not go well. So you always carve the face first. These faces are not necessarily carved all the way through. Um, so it's just going to glow when you put the burning coal in it. Uh, and if you if you hollow it out enough that the edges of the turnip, you know, are thin enough that they becomes kind of translucent. So I think it's actually a little bit spookier in some ways than, than a jack-o'-lantern made out of a pumpkin. Um, but it's a lot easier to carve a jack-o'-lantern made out of pumpkin because uh, they're already partially hollow, which is not true of turnips. And then this is just a fun vintage postcard I found that's a little bit, when you start to think about it, you're like, hmm, so it's a, a personified pumpkin, right? And he's sitting down to eat a pumpkin pie and you're like, that's kind of cannibalism. Makes you wonder if the pumpkin pie is made out of his insides, you don't know. It's kind of creepy without really thinking about it, right? Um, apples play a hugely important role in Halloween historically. I would argue that apples are actually more important than pumpkins when you're talking about the history of Halloween, uh, even though you see them a lot, but apples, we're doing a lot more with apples in the period. So again, they're super available. They're long lasting, they're a cold storage fruit. Um, and I had already mentioned that Ireland, they call Halloween Snap Apple Night. Um, and Snap Apple is a game where you take two sticks and you kind of put them in a cross position and you have strings with apples tied on them on one, one end. On the other end, um, you stick a burning candle and you suspend it from the ceiling and spin it. And you're supposed to try and catch the apple with your mouth uh, without getting hit in the face with a burning candle. Um, there are safer versions. You have versions like this, you know, these, this is a, um, early 20th century postcard. And so they're in 18th century fancy dress, right? This is a fancy dress Halloween party, a costume party. And so the guy has an apple on a string. And so the girl's got to try and get it with her mouth without using her arms, right? Um, and so you see that version. There's also a version where it's the spinning cross with apples, but then instead of a lighted candle, they have a little sack of flour. So if you get hit in the face, you get covered in flour, right? And everybody knows that you got hit in the face. So slightly less dangerous, but no less humiliating. Um, 
We also have bobbing for apples. And so a lot of these things are not necessarily directly associated with Halloween, but they're, you know, games of skill. You know, they're very difficult. So people kind of have to make a fool of themselves to make the attempt and that's funny. And so uh, that's, I think, kind of half the fun is both playing and observing other people play. But it's also an opportunity to do some courtship, right? Like we see in this picture, Halloween historically was very associated with romance, which maybe comes as a surprise to a lot of people. But it's an excuse for young people to get together, to have fun. Um, some of the social mores are maybe a little bit more relaxed. Uh, and it's just, um, you know, the harvest is over. It's like a good celebration before the winter time. Uh, so bobbing for apples, obviously you are floating apples in a large container of water and again, trying to get them with your mouth. There's a couple of ways you can do it. Some people are going to try and bite the stem. Some people are going to try and like create suction with their mouth and get it that way. Some people are going to like shove their whole head in the water and try and trap the apple between their mouth and the bottom of the tub. So you know, I think it's a game for maybe the younger <laughs> generations for, especially for young boys to kind of show off um, their prowess, right? But then also if you're sticking your head in the water with another person, it's a way to get close to them. So we do also have um, slightly more edible uses for apples. Uh, we have candy and caramel apples. Caramel apples come Later in the late 19th, early 20th century, candied apples, candy or candied apples are more common earlier on. Um, and this is probably one of the most famous images of Snap Apple Night. Uh, it's by an Irish artist uh, named Daniel McLeese. He publishes it about 1833 and it just, he, he attended a Snap Apple Night celebration in Ireland in 1832. Uh, and this is his kind of recollection. And there is a lot of stuff going on here. Um, primarily that they are playing Snap Apple. And I don't know if you can see, I have a zoomed in version of the next slide, but you know, here's the, the stick with the candle on it. And then the other sticks with apples, these apples are just stuck on the end of the stick and it's sub, sub, you know coming down from the ceiling on a string. Um, we are bobbing for apples. In the foreground here, they're playing music. Over here, there's kids eating stuff. You know, these girls are kind of watching what's going on. These girls are um, reading the lead, which is where you, you melt lead on the open fire and drip it into water and the shape of the lead tells you something about your future. Um, this courting couple, you can't really see, is doing some chestnut divination, some nut-based divination, which we'll talk about. And then it's hard to tell what's going on here. I can't tell if this is a mirror with a person in, or if it's part of her shawl. Um, but mirror divination was also a thing that happened uh, at Halloween. So if I can click properly. So this is a zoomed in version. And this is uh, the text that accompanied it in the catalog. It says, this was inspired by a Halloween party Daniel McLeese attended in Blarney, Ireland in 1832. And it said, there was Peggy dancing with Dan while Maureen the lead was melting, right over here in the corner, to prove how their fortunes ran with cards could Nancy dealt in. So there must be some card reading somewhere in here. There was Kate and her sweetheart Will, they're in nuts, their true love burning. So that's, they're doing their nut divination on the hearth. And poor Nora, though smiling still, she missed the snap apple turning. Right, so just a fun little rhyme about everything that's happening in this image. There's also this much less fine copy that was done by Courier and Ives. I mean, look at this guy's face. It's just like not, not a good copy of it, but a little bit clearer. Um, and so they're still reproducing this into 1853, right? Even though it's a reproduction of an 1830. So 20 years later, they're still making versions of it. And you can see what's happening a little bit clearer in some of these spots. So there's this kid tickling the guy playing the, the fiddle uh, with a feather in his ear and the kids are bobbing for apples. You know, the boys are the ones who are actually getting wet. The girls just kind of watching. There's people playing music. There's dancing, um, kids watching. This little boy is peeking in whatever's in this sack, right? So um, 
it's a very mixed age group and the courting couples are the focus of the painting. So these are just a couple more images of different versions of snap apple. Right here's a cute one from 1908. So this is just apples on a string and they're cooperating, right, to get their apple. Uh, this is another cute little girl, probably from the 1920s or 30s. Again, snap apple. So you see it a lot in, in the tropes. And then of course, bobbing for apples. I love this image because these girls are looking pretty skeptical <laughs> about bobbing for apples, especially this girl. This one's like, yeah, come on, do it. And she's like, oh, I don't know. Right, that's how I would be. And then this is also a relatively famous image um, that is from the uh, end of the century, or sorry, the, the turn of the 20th century, um, right before World War I, which maybe the artist intended to kind of communicate about the decadence of the wealthy. But this is literally they're bobbing for apples in this fountain, this, you know, neoclassical fountain in this very fancy house. Nobody is wearing a costume. Right, this is just a regular fancy party, but it, it's Halloween, so they're bombing for apples in the fountain. Um, and then I think this is a reference to uh, mirror divination. So at mid, the trope for this divination is if a girl goes into a darkened room at midnight and holds a candle in front of a mirror, behind her she'll see the man she's going to marry, right? And so I think that's, she's holding this candle up in front of this mirror and Maybe this guy's trying to be like, oh, look, here I am. You, you're going to marry me, right? Um, so just a really interesting take, but also an indication of how far Halloween had permeated all classes of society. So we're going from, you know, relatively lower class, working class people in Ireland to here now, you know, 80 years later, we're in the upper echelons of probably New York, New York or Boston society, right? Oops, I went backwards instead of forwards. Okay, so I made a reference in the Daniel McLeese painting to um, nut divination, right? And you might be like, what, nuts? Who talks about nuts at Halloween? Well, people did historically. So fall was definitely the harvest time for nuts. We had nutting day, which was September 14th. And that's traditionally the day that hazelnuts are ripe in the British Isles. September 21st is the devil's nutting day, which is the day apparently that you were not supposed to pick nuts. Um, and then September 29th was known as crack nut Sunday, which believe it or not meant that you would eat nuts in the shell in church. And, you know, one wonders how the person was able to do their sermon <laughs> with all the noise of people cracking and crunching on nuts, but that was, that was a thing. Um, Halloween is sometimes also known as Nutcrack Night. Uh, that's the Scottish, one of the Scottish names for it. Um, and a very traditional thing to do is chestnut or nut divination in general, but usually with chestnuts, which is what is happening here. These are the chestnuts and they're like, oh, uncertainty, hope, oh, despair. They shot apart from each other, happily ever after, right? So. The chestnut divination is you take two nuts, one for you and one for your romantic partner, and you put them on, on the hearth quite close to the fire. And as they heat up, what they do gives you a clue to your future. But the basic gist of it is if they get closer together, that's a good sign. If they fly apart, that's a bad sign. If one of them flies apart from the other one, you know, that means that person is gonna leave up or dump the other person. So just a fun, a fun thing to, to do to figure out if you're with the person you're supposed to be, right? Um, and then also people were consuming a lot of nuts. Uh, here in the United States, do you see like recipes for nut bread, lots of um, walnuts, pecans, peanuts especially, and peanut brittle. Again, we normally associate that with uh, Christmas, right? I didn't put that on my Christmas list, I probably should. Um, but peanut brittle in the period was very much associated with Halloween. And then you also see a lot of references to peanut butter, particularly the types of Halloween menus where you're serving sandwiches. Um, nut, you know, cream cheese and nut bread was a very popular party food in general. Um, but you start to see that and also peanut butter sandwiches like peanut butter and bacon sandwiches. So that's like a pretty Halloween-y style thing. Um, 
So a couple more postcards. So this is a, a fun little one of a lot of stuff going on. So they're bobbing for apples. This kid's playing snap apple night with himself, right? And this older girl is uh, doing some nut divination, right, on the hearth. And then there's some ghosts and a lot of jack-o'-lanterns, right? So it's just greetings for the day. Well, very clearly the day is Halloween. We also have a lot of association with Halloween of popcorn. I couldn't find any good images um, of Halloween of popcorn, but I found this awesome one of a girl dressed up as like the queen of corn, right? Um, so popcorn historically very popular as a snack uh, in the United States, dating back all the way to indigenous people who were the ones who invented um, and cultivated the specific type of corn that creates popcorn. Um, the corn harvest is happening in the fall and you get the development in particular of like basically candied popcorn in the form of popcorn balls. Um, first made with molasses and then as white sugar becomes more available, made with a sugar syrup. And then as we get into the 20th century and corn syrup becomes available, made with corn syrup. Um, a lot of them were made uh, as a pharmacy snack. Pharmacies in the 19th century really started to branch out into soda fountains, into candy making, um, stuff like that. And popcorn balls were kind of in that same realm but people did also make them at home and then we do get caramel corn but really not until the 20th century um popcorn balls predate caramel caramel corn by quite a bit um what we know today as like cracker jack so caramel corn is really a late very very late 19th early 20th century invention you also sometimes see it referred to as candied corn in uh, recipes and references so this was the earliest reference um, I could find to popcorn balls. There was another reference to a historic cookbook from the, the 1860s online. And I went to that historic cookbook online and there was no popcorn ball recipe in there. So I don't know where that reference came from. Um, but this is a very early one. It's from 1875. It's in this crazy San Francisco cookbook, which is also like, how to make everything in your life basically um but this is almost certainly designed this recipe is almost certainly designed for a uh, sale right because why would you make a hundred popcorn balls unless you're going to sell them uh, and it's also calls for gum arabic which is some households might have had access to that but mostly you're getting that from the pharmacist so this is probably a recipe for a pharmacy um, to make popcorn balls to sell. Okay, now we can talk about devilish foods, right? These are not 100%, you know, they don't originate with Halloween, but you do start to see them pop up on Halloween menus, I think in large part because of the title. Um, deviled foods go back pretty far in, in uh, England in particular, deviled kidneys, are super old. Um, deviled eggs are a little less old. Uh, and then we have things like deviled ham and crab. Deviled in when we're talking about savory foods almost always means the addition of either cayenne pepper, chili sauce or chili powder, um, or, or prepared, uh, not prepared, um, dry mustard powder, which is quite spicy. Um, if you've ever had it or if you've ever tried to make a mustard out of like Coleman's mustard, dry mustard, it's like a hot, a hot mustard, right? So it's the devil is in reference to the spice. Devil's food cake um, is the, the opposite of angel food cake. So angel food cake becomes popular in really the second half of the 19th century. You know, it's very light, very airy, white, very white cake. Devil's food cake is the opposite. It's very rich, it's very moist, um, and it's very dark chocolate. It's not like that kind of light brown chocolate that maybe you've seen before, but it tends to be much, much darker in color. Um, and it's usually, as you can see from these recipes over here, it's usually using um, grated baker's chocolate rather than a cocoa powder, which tends to make it uh, a little bit darker. 
this was super fun and interesting. This was the earliest reference I could find to the phrase deviled eggs. So stuffed eggs, like what we think of as deviled eggs today are, are historically called stuffed eggs. They've existed since like, you know, ancient times. You take a hard boiled egg, you take the yolk out, you mix it with a bunch of stuff, you put it back in the white. That's for stuffed eggs have been around forever. This was the earliest reference to, I could find to deviled eggs, and it's so different. So it's basically you're taking just the hard-boiled yolks, and you're like dipping them in egg, then in oil, and then you're rolling them in cayenne pepper and salt, and then you're heating them, and then serving with olive oil or and chutney sauce or chili vinegar. So they're like. It's just the yolk, the hard boiled yolk, and it's super spicy. So I think that is a very interesting, you know, the evolution of how we got from this to calling stuffed eggs deviled eggs. Um, I think it's interesting. I think the transition is really that we're putting paprika and mustard powder in our eggs. Um, but I find it interesting that mid 19th century, you know, our tastes, we had a lot, a lot more spicy things um, maybe than we did later in the century, which I find interesting. And this is a fun little, a little postcard with a devil and his little minion. So we have apple and they have peanut arms. And I couldn't tell if these are fig or chestnut heads. They're probably figs. So they're raiding, they're raiding the dessert table on Halloween. So they're, they're getting, you know, the box of chocolates and there's like a fruity sherbet punch here. And then there's also some other fruit, but they're just raiding the table for Halloween, which I thought was cute. All right, so the big thing that's happening in the 19th century is kind of a formalization of the Halloween party, right? Which of course dates all the way back to that 1830s image of the, the Irish Halloween party. But in the United States, they tend to be a little bit more formal um, and a little bit more focused on grown-ups and romance. We don't get kid parties really until the early 20th century. The focus is on largely on adults um, and a lot of divination games, so many divination games. What starts to change that is the publication of something called Denison's Bogey Books, which starts in 1909. Uh, the Denison's Manufacturing Company was like a crepe paper uh, manufacturing company. So they made like decorative paper products. 1909 is their bogey book. Um, and it's all about Halloween. They don't publish another one until 1912. But then pretty much after that, they're publishing these books annually. And they're part catalog, right? Because they want you to buy all this stuff, part idea book and part advertisement. Um, so they're selling stuff like this, I chose this image because it's got like the printed paper tablecloth and they have like these table decorations and there's all this crepe paper decorations and all kinds of, you can make hats and like, you know, they have these little printed paper ornaments that you can stick on things. Um, they're full of ideas, they're full of game ideas, they have costume ideas uh, and it just kind of commercializes Halloween parties a little bit, but also makes them more accessible and really kind of solidifies these, these um, symbols of Halloween in the public consciousness, you know, black cats, owls, bats, witches, um, jack-o'-lanterns, the moon, you know, things like that uh, all get more closely associated with Halloween. Like I said, you start to get the shift to more children-oriented parties. Uh, in the early 20th century, and for sure, post-war, it's all about the kids. Um, interestingly, menus at these Halloween parties tend to be like just regular party food <laughs> that maybe you gussy up a little bit to make it more Halloween-y, or maybe it's a little bit more seasonal than you might do otherwise, but there's not a lot of, of special foods outside of desserts that are associated with with Halloween parties in this time period. Home economists have a huge impact on parties in general and entertaining in general in the early 20th century. Um, Halloween is no exception. There's a lot of obsession with like red and black or sorry, orange and black or yellow and black. 
uh, themed, you know, like the food is all white or all yellow or all black or like combination of both. Um, and also a lot of it is about presentation and looks and decoration more so than like how the food actually tastes. Um, so these are a couple of bogey book covers. Uh, I did a whole blog post about bogey books if you want to learn more about them. This is an example of an interior decoration uh, for a hall. You can see why the bogey books were popular, but also like how the Denison's company is making money off of them because it's like you can buy all of this stuff from Denison's, right? And if you don't want to buy it, they'll show you how to make it out of their regular crepe paper products. Um, these are a couple of sample Halloween menus. Um, this one is kind of a joke menu. <laughs> So it's uh, three different menu options, but it's the same foods, just in a different order. So it's like you play a trick on your guests that they think there's three different options for the menu, but it's all the same foods, right? But it's very typical party foods, you know, celery and olives and salted almonds, chicken salad and aspic, right? Oh, there's a witch sandwich. So is that just a sandwich? You know, is that just a... a title or is it actually Halloween themed? We don't know. You know, and then biscuits and macaroons and a demi tasse of coffee, right? That's very typical party food in general. Um, this one is supposedly for a Halloween party at home. It's a little elaborate, I think, for a Halloween party. So we're starting off with baked oysters. And graham sandwiches, graham bread is like a whole wheat bread. It's very dark. So it's probably just bread and butter, but it's whole wheat. Then we have roast turkey and chestnut stuffing with baked apples and cold rolls, right, bread. Then we have a little break with salted almonds and olives. Then we have another course of tongue salad. Like, so that's probably smoked beef tongue, probably, you know, chopped up in mayonnaise. A cabbage salad, a hickory nut cake, autumn cake, Halloween cake ice cream, coffee, chocolate, and then a whole bunch of candies, and then fruits, russet oranges, russet apples, apples, melons, and then again, nuts and raisins, which is very typical to end um, a fancy meal with, with fruit and nuts um, and dried fruit, right? No cheese though, which would have been typical too. So this is an example of kind of what Halloween decorating and Halloween parties looked like in the period. Um, and you can see kind of some of the bogey influence. So we have like these printed cutouts of a jack-o'-lantern and owls. And there's also printed cutouts of like a cat and a jack-o'-lantern right up here. And then someone has made an artistic fake pumpkin. And we have some little cats, you know, on our, on our cutlery, it looks like here. But otherwise it's just like little bonbon and coffee, right? Very typical, typical party fare. So these are a couple other illustrations from the American Cookery Magazine, which is also known as the Boston Cooking School Magazine. So this is like very home economy. So like, oh, we're gonna have a Halloween cake. It's just a regular cake. And then we put some Halloween-y cutouts on it. Or, oh, we're gonna have jack-o'-lanterns, but it's literally like an orange peel that we cut a face in and then we fill it with sherbet. You know, so it's more about the look of things necessarily than the taste. That's very typical of the period. Um, so at our Halloween parties, it became very fashionable in the 19th and early 20th century to do these kind of very old fashioned divination games, right? So one was apple peeling. So you would peel a long strand of peeling from an apple and toss it over your shoulder. And then however it landed was supposed to be like the initial of the person you were gonna marry. Um, kale in Scotland, and to a lesser extent in the United States, this is mostly in Scotland, there was a whole bunch of divination, so you would like pull the kale up in the fall, that's often how you would store it, is you would pull it up by the root, and then hang it upside down, they did this with cabbage and kale, and that was supposed to help it keep longer in like a, a cool uh, root cellar, but like how long the stock was, what the stock looked like, how many clumps of dirt were on it, that would tell you something about your future. Um, if you took a piece of cabbage or kale and put it under your pillow, then you were like in a dream about the person you love. Um, and then in Ireland in particular, they would have Colcannon night, right? Where you're making 
a giant batch of colcannon and they would put it in a big heap and whoever was the cook or the host would like stick charms in the mashed potatoes. And when you took your serving, you got a charm that would like tell you about your future, right? So like if you got a ring, you're gonna get married. If you got like a thimble or a button, you're gonna be like a spinster forever. If you got a coin, you're gonna be rich, you know, stuff like that. We already talked a little bit about chestnuts, right? But nuts on the fire and how they pop or move is, is also a divination. There was the development similar to the Colcannon thing of a dumb cake or Halloween cake, which is basically you bake a cake uh, with charms in it. And then when you get a slice, your charm again tells you your future. And then they would have dumb suppers, which I think is really probably quite closely connected to um, Samhain of having basically like setting a place at the table for your ancestor, right? On the, the night, one night of the year when they can maybe actually visit you from beyond the grave. Um, but this became a thing in the 19th century, with, especially with young girls, as you would go out in kind of a secluded area, like an abandoned farmhouse or a cottage, and you would make a supper and everything would be backwards, right? So you'd serve the dessert first, you'd turn the chairs backwards, things would be upside down. And supposedly at midnight, um, you know, you would set an extra place and supposedly at midnight, the person you were gonna marry was gonna walk through the door. Whether they were a ghost or a real person, who knows, but I think it was mostly an excuse for girls to freak themselves out <laughs> in spooky places. Um, so here's some postcard illustrations. So here's the girl, you know, she has cut herself a long, a long twist of peel and she's throwing it over her shoulder and like peeking back to see who, what the initial is gonna be. Here's another young woman who's like, ooh, she got a wedding ring and her piece of Halloween cake. So that means she's gonna get married. Um, these are some more cute little anthropomorphic vegetables, uh, cutting a cake. Um, and then so we get trick-or-treating, right? Which is the thing that we most closely associate with Halloween and food today. Um, but it was not always what it is today. So it probably comes directly from souling, which is the tradition on All Souls Day or All Souls Eve of the poor basically going from door to door and you know saying a prayer or blessing the owner of the house and then they would get soul cakes in return right so that's basically type of trick-or-treating we also already talked about wassailing and mumming um in in scotland they have guising right um but in the united states it really is more about the tricks than the treats especially prior to World War II. Um, during World War II, you know, it had become kind of the holiday of juvenile delinquents during the Great Depression, especially because people didn't really have money for parties and treats and things like that. And so you have all these kids, there's no jobs, there's nothing to do, they're poor. So, you know, they get kind of destructive. Um, and this is a great cartoon from the San Diego Union from 1942, right? Which is the very first Halloween after the United States enters World War II. And it's the ghosts of the uh, Axis powers, right? So there's Emperor Hirohito, uh, Adolf Hitler, and Benito Mussolini from Italy. And they're saying, do something destructive this Halloween. You'll be helping us, right? So if you're destroying things that are rationed, if you're letting the air out of tires, if you're wasting soap to soap windows, if you're breaking stuff that can't be easily replaced, um, you know, if you're spoiling food or whatever, you're aiding the Axis powers, right? And so there's this little cat up here who's saying, you're an American, don't listen to those goons. So there was a lot of rhetoric during World War II about not doing the trick and prank part of Halloween. Um, and part of that shift was to focus more on other things for kids to do. Uh, and so you get trick-or-treating, you get Halloween costume parades and more like community-minded stuff to try and get kids to not go out and like, you know, set fires in the middle of the road and stuff like that. Um, trick-or-treating also post-war is developing in suburbia, you have this huge influx of 
you know, just residential neighborhoods with sidewalks and a huge influx of people who are all kind of the same age. They all have, they're all having kids at the same time. You know, it's a safe area. And so kind of our American ideal of trick-or-treating comes specifically from this time period and specifically from the suburbs. Um, you're not, in, you know, if you live in an apartment, where are you going to trick or treat? If you live uh, in a very urban area where it's mixed use, where are you going to trick or treat? You know, it's not single family homes on a tree lined street with sidewalks necessarily for everybody. So there is a little bit of a class divide uh, and a racial divide with, with trick or treating too. Candy companies definitely run with the whole idea of trick or treating. You know, post-war, they're making fun size stuff. They're doing all kinds of advertising specifically about Halloween and Halloween parties and trick-or-treating. Um, and by the end, by after World War II, Halloween is, is pretty firmly entrenched throughout the United States as probably the most popular secular holiday in the country. So that brings us to our Halloween candy. I love this little meme that I found on the internet. So I put this up here about you know how kids judge judge you for your Halloween candy offering. Um, so like I said, it kind of starts in, in pharmacies are the main candy producers until really the second half of the 19th century. And we start to get um, more specialization in companies like Hershey, you know, making, making candy uh, for a national audience. Um, but pharmacies start out, you know, they've got chocolate, they're making um, wafers, like necro wafers, they're making cream filled candies, popcorn balls, candied fruits, jellies, things like that for commercial consumption. Um, people are also making homemade candy and treats, popcorn balls, peanut brittle, candy apples, panouche, pralines, candied nuts, fudge, you know, pies cookies, gingerbread, all that fun stuff. Um, but like I said, commercial companies really by the early 20th century are kind of taking over. And what really stops people from making homemade candy or homemade treats and giving them out at Halloween is we have a series of candy scares in the 70s, you know, the kind of urban legend about razor blades. I've also seen a ton of stuff about like, oh, check your kid's candy for drugs. And I'm like, nobody is going to buy expensive drugs and put them in candy for children. That's just not going to happen. So a lot of the fears around Halloween and candy are, are urban legends, um, but not all of them, which is, I think, why people freak out, but also why there's so much emphasis on, you know, individually packaged, termetically sealed commercially produced foods, right, are considered safer. Interestingly, I love this one that, you know, some of the most hated candies tend to be the oldest, right? And I think the association with uh, older people too, um, they're the less popular, usually less chocolate brands. I really love chocolate for Halloween. Um, so let's talk about some of those hated candies. Probably top of the list as most associated with Halloween and possibly most hated is candy corn. Um, it develops in the late 19th century with the development of corn syrup. Uh, and we get something also called butter candies, which is really a new kind of taste sensation among candies. So, you know, we have hard candies, we have chocolates, we have some kind of gelatin style based candies like jellies and stuff like that. Um, but there's this development of something called butter candies, which is like this kind of soft, melt in your mouth, super sweet candy um, that candy corn really personifies. Um, initially, it was called chicken feed because it looks like feed corn, uh, and humans don't eat feed corn. Uh, we do eat uh, that kind of style of dried corn as corn meal. We don't usually eat it fresh. Historically, sweet corn was really green corn, which is immature feed corn. So you're, you have to basically eat it as soon as you pick it. Um, otherwise, the sugars in the corn start turning to starch. So in the 20th century, we get the development of more sweet corn varieties that 
don't instantly turn their sugars to starch. Um, but that's the 19th century that the corn that was around. So people were not, you know, necessarily eating like a lot of canned corn or eating a lot of fresh corn. So it's invented starting in 1880 by George Renner and the Wonderly Camp Candy Company. Um, the recipe or the the method is purchased by the the Golet Golet's company, um, which today is Jelly Belly, in 1898. Um, and I think you know a lot of the stuff online says that it's like purchased from Wonderly and like Wonderly stops manufacturing it, but that's not true. I've seen advertisements up to World War II, which we'll talk about in a minute. Post World War II. It has a number of names prior to World War II, but World War II really solidifies um, afterwards the name Candy Corn. Um, and Brock's Candy com Company kind of like corners the market by the end of the 20th century. Um, they're also producing pumpkins, right? So Candy Corn is the most popular, but those little cute little buttercream, butter candy pumpkins are being produced too. So here's my proof that Wonderly keeps making it, right? So here's this advertisement um, from the 1950s, from 1951, and they are making big corn and some pumpkins, right? In the cellophane bag, Wonderly's candy. So they're still producing candy corn, uh, but not under the candy corn moniker. Um, Brock's company, it starts in like, like 1909. So they're a little bit of latecomers. Um, but they really start to dominate the scene pretty quickly. You'll also see like Halloween specials. So they're doing olives and pickles and wieners and sweet potatoes and nuts, right? Here's another holiday popcorn, right? With oil and salt. So that's like popcorn, make your own popcorn. There's marshmallows, Cracker Jack, right? That's like caramel corn, all kinds of fun snacky things. Don't ask me why shredded wheat. It's in the Halloween specials, I don't know. So anyway, so this is the other probably most hated Halloween candy. I, I did a whole blog post about this a couple of years ago. It's like the most popular blog post on my website ever. I'm not really sure why, but um, Mary Jane's are molasses taffy wrapped around peanut butter filling. That's what they were historically, although people say the modern incarnation tastes more like a honey taffy than molasses. I guess the molasses is a little too old fashioned, even for Mary Jane's now. They're invented in 1894 by the Charles H. Miller Company, um, probably by Charles's son. Sorry, they're not invented in 1894. That's when the company starts it's in 1894. And then Charles H. Miller's son, Charles N. Miller, invents them in 1914. Although some sources say a guy named Robert O. Lord invents them, but I have not been able to find any actual citations to verify that. So it's probably Charles N. Miller. Uh, they are one of the first penny candies, right? They're these little individually wrapped taffies. They have this fun little jingle, spend your change on Mary Jane's, right? Um, some argument about the origin of the name, whether they're named after um, the shoe, right, which is popularized by Buster Brown, whether they're named after somebody's mom or aunt or whatever, but this is their cute little mascot. They did also historically make like a flat kind, and I think they are so hated because they're individually wrapped, but they're just wrapped in wax paper, right, both this kind and the more taffy you know, salt water taffy looking kind. They're just wrapped in wax paper. So if you don't keep them sealed up, um, they get hard pretty quickly. They tend to go a little bit stale uh, and they are very cheap. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why people don't like them. Another hated candy, uh, which is very old, much older than, than this advertisement would have you believe is Good and Plenty, um, which is a candy coated licorice. Uh, it was invented in, whoops, sorry, that's supposed to be Quaker City, not Quaker City, <laughs> chocolate and confectionery, um, in 1893, and it's probably one of the oldest, if not the oldest, branded brand name candy that is still produced today. Um, it's that licorice flavor, I think, that turns a lot of people off. A lot of people do not like black licorice. Um, you can overdose 
on black licorice and it can have uh, pretty severe health consequences for you, particularly for your heart. So if you are a fan of black licorice, please do not overeat it day after day. You know, if you're eating a pound of licorice a day, that's going to end you up in some trouble because that happened quite recently in the news. A couple of years ago, a guy actually died from overdosing on, on licorice. So um, just be careful. If you don't like it, you're fine. If you do like it, be careful. And this is our classic candy timeline. I'm not going to go through every single one. Um, but some of them are older than you might think, right? We know about Hershey and, and Hershey's Kisses, right? Where are Hershey's Kisses? They're on here somewhere. Um, let me move my doc up to the top here. But, you know, Heath Bar and Lifesavers, there's Hershey Kisses, are super old. Tootsie Rolls are older than Hershey Kisses, right? It's that kind of chewy, corn syrupy time period. Right, my personal favorite, uh, where is it? Is the Zero Bar. I haven't had one in a really long time. I'm gonna get some for Halloween, see if I still like them. Zero Bar uh, is nougat and caramel covered in white chocolate. It's one of the first commercially, um, first commercial uses of, of white chocolate in the United States, right? From a national company. Um, some of the more favorites, right? Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, St. Pack's 1928, right? Mr. Good Bar, 1925, lots of great things happening in the 20s. Um, with Cookie Snickers, our 1930, right? Three Musketeers, our 32. Um, Starburst is another popular non-chocolate one, right? Um, Reese's Pieces. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are so popular that in 1978, they introduced Reese's Pieces, which are also very popular. Twix, my other favorite, 1979. And then growing up, everybody I knew loved Sour Patch Kids, even though I was like, mm -mm, too sour for me. But just some of the more popular Halloween candies in a little timeline. You can see if your favorite is on there. Some of them have more than one or events in the same year, right? So 1924, we get both Bit of Honey and Dum Dum Lollipops, which you still see everywhere for Halloween. Um, 1923, we got Baby Ruth Bar, Mounds, and Milky Way. Um, that's at the same year, so. So, come on, Clicky. So what's the future of Halloween, right? We've had some big societal changes, especially in the last couple of years with COVID, and uh, our housing patterns are changing. Our birth rate is changing. We've had the development, especially since the 19, excuse me, the 1980s of a lot of curfews and anti-teen laws on Halloween, which makes me sad. I know they're probably trying to, uh, you know, head off at the past any pranks, destructive pranks that teens might be doing. Um, but I'm like, dude, let the teenagers trick or treat, right? It's keeping them out of trouble. Please give, please give candy to any teenagers that show up at your door. Um, there's also increasing societal distrust. We don't trust our neighbors. People don't want to answer the door when somebody comes to knock on the door, right? Because you don't know who it is. Um, so we've developed some trick-or-treat alternatives, like the trunk or treat you see happening here, often hosted by fire departments or EMTs or police departments or, you know, PTAs, things like that. Um, people are trick-or-treating in malls. A number of years ago, I accidentally went to the mall the Saturday before Halloween, and it was full of children in costumes, and I got no shopping done. I just left. Um, and there's also this prevalence of, like, people traveling to good neighborhoods to trick-or-treat, right? Good neighborhoods being neighborhoods where people are decorating, where there's sidewalks where people are known to have candy, where people, you know, they're maybe wealthier neighborhoods, which brings up, you know, some issues of class and sometimes issues of race, like people complaining about people not from their neighborhood coming to trick or treat in their neighborhood. Um, and then of course, COVID put a damper on everything, um, especially before the vaccines were available because it was just, you didn't want strangers coming to your door, right? We are starting to see the return of Halloween parties, um, especially among young people. 
uh, and not just like, you know, an excuse to wear a costume and get drunk, but people are spending more money on decorating, especially during COVID. That was like a way to communicate with your neighborhood was to decorate your house for the holidays. Um, Halloween stuff in general is just super popular, but it seems today that the emphasis is more on decoration and less on food, right? So I love Halloween food. I love vintage Halloween food. I'm hoping that more people kind of adopt some of those older style snacks in the future. So that's my talk. Yep. And again, your website's thefoodhistorian.com. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you for everyone who attended and thank you so much to the friends uh, for supporting our program. And thank you to you, Sarah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Okay. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Yeah. Good night.